Okay. Um, recording is on. Good morning, everyone. Let's uh, take a moment just to pray and we'll get started. And um, I'm sure others will join us soon. Good morning. All right. Uh, let's see. Samuel, why don't you please pray with us and we'll get started. Sure, Pastor. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. We are truly grateful that you've brought us together and you've mm -hmm. given us this opportunity to spend uh, time um, learning about uh, about faith, about our work, um, about uh, Christian apologetics and uh, supernatural ministry. Um, Lord, these are uh, very interesting topics. Uh, these are topics uh, that will um, enable us to further uh, spread your knowledge, your faith, your grace in today's world. Um, Lord, we ask you to open our minds, open our hearts, um, speak to us, Holy Spirit, fill us. Uh, we dedicate Pastor Ashish into your hands. We commit his teaching. Uh, Lord, uh, guide him, uh, fill him with your spirit um, and this class so that we experience uh, your understanding, your peace over us. And everything that we learn in today's class, may we be able to use that uh, to enhance your kingdom to build your kingdom. Thank you for everything. This we ask in the name of Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, once again. Uh, thank you for joining the class. All right. So we are in our initial stage in, uh, uh, in this course on Christian apologetics. And uh, uh, at this point, uh, we are dealing with the main theme, uh, which is on uh, the existence of God and creation. So we, we touched on the existence of God a little earlier, and they've kind of transitioned a little bit now into um, addressing the issue of creation. Of course, uh, when we talk about creation, obviously, uh, the implication is there is God, there is creator God who created everything. So we are kind of dealing with that issue, um, that topic. Um, and uh, so last class, last week, we looked at creation uh, and we said, okay, uh, speaking, you know, uh, at a overall, with an overall perspective, now when we look at cosmology the uh, at a high level, we give six areas. Uh, when you look at it from a uh, from cosmology, when you look at it from physics, when you look at it from uh, biochemistry, when you look at it from a biology or a genetics perspective, when you look at it from a uh, psychology or a moral consciousness perspective, like when you look at it from these different angles, uh, we ultimately come back to the same question or the same thing that, you know, somebody had to give rise to what we are seeing. Yeah, uh, the intelligence that we are seeing, the greatness that we are seeing, you know. So it all comes back to saying, how did it all begin? What was the genesis of these things? You know, whether you look at it from a cosmology perspective, look at it uh, or from a physics perspective, it all comes back to where did this come from? There is intelligence, there is design, there is so much of order and power and what was the origin? So we now kind of, uh, uh, what we're going to do today. So so, re so the real big question is, okay, where did it all start? Where did it all begin? So we're going to transition into that question, right? So we started from God, creation, beginning. Where did it begin? How did it begin? Right. So there are two big um, I wouldn't say too big, but there are two main um, thoughts as far as origin is concerned. One uh, is the origin of life. Uh, so for, as far as the origin of life, 
uh, we have to look at evolutionary biology, uh, what they claim, and then the origin of the cosmos, the universe. And for that, uh, science give, presents the Big Bang uh, as one of the possible ways. So science is presenting evolutionary biology uh, um, as an explanation for the origin of life on the planet and also presenting the Big Bang theory as a possible explanation for the origin of the cosmos, the universe, everything that we see, the planets, the earth and everything else. So we are going to you know, uh, address that. Now, uh, before we transition into doing those things, we just want to look at Genesis chapter one today in, in the first hour today that we have. Uh, just look at creation. So God, the Bible is giving us Genesis chapter one as the origin of everything. In Genesis one, you find the origin of the cosmos. In Genesis one, you find the origin of life. So we'll just spend some time, one, one session, one session in Genesis 1. Then we will look at evolutionary biology, one session. That's uh, the second hour. Next week, we'll spend one hour on the Big Bang, which is both these are sci science, uh, a presentation from science as the possible origin of life and the universe. Now, uh, what I do, I just want to say, you know, uh, we are spending only one hour on each of these. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you could spend a whole, you can spend many hours uh, on each each of these topics, but we can't afford to do that because we're going to move on to many other topics. Um, but I do want to say that you know there is a uh, uh, there's a lot of a lot of um, uh, especially at present there's a lot of uh, uh, Christian scientists, or let me put it like this, scientists who are Christians, scientists who are believers, who have written a lot of good books, you know, uh, and uh, uh, some names, If I mean, so, so basically I want to encourage you, if you are interested, in, and each one has different uh, interests, so we don't want to force it on everybody, but if you are interested, you, know, you could explore, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 read these books. There's just uh, many of them, right? Uh, uh, and uh, uh, John Lennox, the fancy Maya. Uh, 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 there, there are many names, many names. But I'll just mention two. John Lennox is a scientist, he's a believer. And he looks at things from the physics perspective, mathematical perspective. Steven C. Meyer is a scientist who looks at it from a biological, Christian, but looks at it from a biological perspective. So they have done a lot of uh, 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 books. So, now, of course, from the scientific community, you have some big names. You have uh, the Stephen Hawking was there. Uh, there was, uh, there is Richard Dawkins. He's a big person, big name who has written a lot of books. So Stephen Hawking, Richard Dawkins, uh, 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 you know, from a scientific perspective, they try to say that, the, give their explanations of how uh, the, the universe came in. So, you know, and you would find that uh, you know, both sides, but we want to thank God for, you know, these scientists who are Christians, who are believers, and were able to provide a response to the scientists who are atheists uh, you know, and 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 say that look, uh, this is what um, this is how things are, right? But but what I wanted to point out is that there is a lot of uh, good book. There are a lot of good books from different perspectives. That uh, and if you, whatever your interest is, and you can study it further. But uh, you know, um, I'm going to just try and address some things, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's not going to be comprehensive or. Uh, you know, complete, but there are good people there doing a lot of good work. Now, very interesting, you know, that, uh, um, and, and this was, uh, I was just reading one of uh, John Lennox's books. Uh, uh, he mentions that uh, uh, between 2001, the last century, basically from 19, 
100 to 2000, the last 100 years, over 60% of the Nobel Prize winners were Christians, people of faith. Uh, and, and then, you know, if you break it down, you know, uh, for the different disciplines of Nobel Peace Prize, you know, it kind of touches, crosses 60, you know, even goes up to 70 in some categories, 70% were people of faith Christians. And they won the Nobel Prize for, you know, different disciplines. Uh, which goes to say that you can be a scientist, you can be very good in your work, and still have faith in God, you know, and, and believe the Bible, believe the truth, you know. So the idea that um, uh, just because you're dealing with science, you shouldn't have faith, uh, that's a wrong uh, notion. Okay. All right. So the plan for today is in this lecture, we look at Genesis. What did God say as the origin of the universe and life? And of course, there are some questions around it. We'll deal with a few things. Then we get into the next hour, we look at evolutionary biology. It's gonna be very short, uh, you know, 15 minutes to try to condense everything, but I, I will give us the main challenge there, okay? And give us an essence, a gist of, uh, you know, what is out there, what people are writing and how they are responding, okay? Um, so I'm gonna just share my screen and we will, Okay, why don't we do this? Yeah, let's just read Genesis chapter one so we get it. I know we are all familiar with Genesis one, but uh, sometimes we <clears throat> we read it very rarely because uh, most of us know it. But let's just read the whole chapter, uh, and then we will make get into the notes. And, uh, so let's go Genesis chapter one. Uh, can each one just you know we'll just go through this very quickly, uh, just three verses each, uh, and then we'll get into the questions about Genesis chapter one. Could somebody do, let's start, uh, just three verses each, Genesis one. We'll go through it quickly. Okay, let's start. I could start us off. Please go ahead, Samuel. The creation of the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the faces of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the, li the light day, and darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Verse 7, yeah. Thus God uh, Thus? made a pivot and divided the waters which were under the firmament of uh, from the waters uh, which were above the pyramid and we, it was so and God called the pyramid heaven so the evening and morning were uh, second day uh, then God said let the waters be under heaven uh, be together, uh, together in one place, and dry land uh, appears, uh, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruits, fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so, and the earth brought forth grass, 
the herb that yields seed according to the kind and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind and god saw that it was good and and the earth brought forth grass and the herds sorry and the evening and the morning were the third day and god said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs or for seasons and for days and for years and let them be for and let them be for the lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so and god made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and a lesser night to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the ferment of the heaven to give them upon the earth, to give light upon the earth. Okay, somebody, verse 18. And to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and god saw it saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day uh, and god said let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fall that may fly about the earth in the open ferment uh, of heaven thank you so god created great sea creature, every living thing that moves with which the water abounded according to their kind and every wing bird according to his kind and God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply and fill the water in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kind, livestock, and creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kind. And it was so. And God made, made the beasts of the earth according to their kind. Oh, sorry, I'm repeating this off. Um, Verse 25, okay. yeah. Okay, sure. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kind, and the living stock according to their kind and everything that crept on the on the ground according to its kinds and god saw that it was good then god said let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over everything creeping things that creep, creeps on the on the earth so god created man in his own image in the image of god he created him male and female he created them then god blessed them and god said to them be fruitful and multiply fill the earth and subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruits fruit yields seed. So uh, to you uh, it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. All right. Um, all right. Yeah, it, it would be. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, it, it does continue on into chapter two, where, um, you know, God forms man out of the dust of the earth, we, we get those details uh, in chapter two. But in Genesis one, we have the Bible account of how everything came into existence. 
and it says God created. Now, there are, you know, and we're going to get into a few specific questions, but I just, you know, generally when people read Genesis 1, uh, a lot of questions begin to come up. You know, for instance, I just uh, highlight some differences, right? So uh, we see, you know, on day, uh, so first in the very beginning, God creates, you know, verse 1, heavens and the earth. Uh, which is telling us all the planetary bodies, including the earth, came into existence. Heavens, meaning the vast expanse of this universe, came into existence. Then there is light. But the sun is created only on the fourth day. So people, you know, that's one of the questions we will look at. You know, so where was light when the sun was, you know, for... Uh, there was light in the very beginning, but on day one, but sun was created in day four. So that people will question that, you know, hey, see, it's wrong. This is just made up. Uh, another big difference between Bible's account and evolutionary biology is According to evolutionary biology, somehow, you know, when all these things, you know, uh, things came into existence, life started like this, came out of the water, came into the land, and then moved to fly, birds that can fly. The adaptation happened. But according to the Bible account, sea creatures were made, birds were made, then on the next day, land animals were made, created, you know, so it's a different sequence. So, so, hey, you know, so there's an immediate mismatch in what evolutionary biology is saying. Well, you had to start with the water, you came onto the land, and then you went into the air. Uh, whereas God just created everything in the sea, everything in the air, and the next day he created things on the land. Uh, you know, a life on the land. That's a difference. Then when we look at the Big Bang, things had to begin with the stars and then the earth was formed. So stars came in first and then earth was formed. According to Genesis account, earth was there. Then the stars came into existence uh, on day four. So again, there's a difference. Earth came first, stars came later. According to the Big Bang, stars came first, Earth came later, right? So there's these significant differences, um, right? Uh, uh, between what we are reading in Genesis, what God is telling us about the origin of the universe and of life, and what science is telling us about the origin of the universe and of life. These differences are there, major differences. So today, uh, in this first uh, lecture, we will questions that, uh, you know, uh, people in general, people ask about creation based on Genesis. We will go into uh, evolutionary biology next class, next lecture, talk about Big Bang. And then as we close, we will take up some more specific questions connecting all these, you know, based on what science says through biology and through uh, uh, physics and uh, some more questions, more specific questions, okay? But let's talk about some general questions that um, people ask in relation to Genesis and uh, ideas that are there, which I think uh, we should uh, just be prepared to think about and provide a response. So I'm just going to the notes here. And uh, so we've read Genesis 1. So a common question is, you know, okay, uh, the earth, according to the, you know, according to science, the universe, uh, as of now, as of now, according to science, the universe is about 14 billion years old. And the earth is about 4 billion years old. Now the numbers can change over time, you know, Initially, it began with eight, and then ten, and then it's 
somewhere now around 14. I mean, what, what people are putting out. But I'm just saying in general, science tells us, well, the universe is 14 billion years old. The earth is about four billion years old. But according to Genesis, you know, everything happened. Uh, and according to Genesis, it all happened in a six day period, right? So how do we explain that? How do we explain that? Now, uh, 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 as part of question two, I will go into some other theories that, uh, you know, uh, that people put out, but, um, you know, generally, uh, sorry, going back to the first question, my response and the response that I want to just place before all of us is that in the creative act of God, and I mentioned this, uh, I think in the last week, class last week, that we believe in the creative act of God, time was compressed in his creative act. That means what we, through our scientific, when I say we, people, scientists, um, who through the scientific process come to the conclusion as thousands, millions, billions of years, we believe that in the creative act of God, it all happened the moment he spoke. Take, for example, the sun. Okay. So we read here, you know, uh, verse 14, God said that there be lights. That means the stars. And, uh, and he created the lights, the sun, big, big stars and small stars. How did it happen? He said, let there be lights, stars, luminaries, luminous bodies. He just said, the stars came into existence, big stars, small stars. So you take one star, the sun. Oh, so today, from what we know, this sun, the sun, this, you know, Comparatively, for us, it's a big star, but comparatively, it's a small star. Um, is actually millions of miles in diameter. The sun is so big. And it's so intense in its heat. It's, it's huge just for us to understand how big one star is. So obviously, uh, through the scientific process, you know, for something like that to take place uh, and come together and, 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 and it generates so much of energy. Uh, science says, well, it would have taken so many millions of years or billions of years for all that to come together. Well, what we are saying here or what the Bible is telling us here is it took an instant. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament. That means in this vast expanse of the universe, the heavenly realms, let there be lights in the firmament. Stars started popping up everywhere, big stars and small stars. But all happened as he spoke. All the energy, all the matter that was needed to come into existence, came in as he spoke. So in an instant, these came into being. So what we understand as something that would take millions of years for energy and matter to come into existence like this, in this kind of fashion, happened in an instant. Okay, so Similarly, uh, let me see, I think, did somebody raise their hand? So similarly, uh, when uh, we say that the earth 
is 4 billion years old. Um, we're saying, well, in the heavens, God created, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It is a creative act of God that brought the earth into existence. So what we think was so many millions or billions of years took place in an act of creation. Okay. Daisha, you have a question? Yes, I do. Go ahead. I wanted to draw a reference in. Um, what about the scripture that says a day is like a thousand years in the sight of God? That's mm -hmm. one they, they would draw from to say it could be that the Bible is saying it's a day, but it's not really a natural day as in our day, 12 hour, 24 hour day. Um, it's not a day that that could be a, or an argument, you know, to support yeah, yeah. that theory. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so um, how, sorry, I was saying, so how would one respond to if that point is brought up? Because that one usually comes along with these theories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. We're going to look at that. Good, good that you brought it up. So that's going. That's what we address in our second question, right? under our second question, uh, where you know there is what we refer to as the day theory, where people say, and sometimes, and, and this of course is from the Christian community, where they say that uh, well, uh, each of these days that we see here in Genesis um, is actually thousands of years because the bible says a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day that's second peter three but we will see as we will explain when we get into the next question that actually is uh, it doesn't hold and I'll, and we will state the reasons right we'll give specific reasons why that doesn't hold when we read genesis one i mean i just give you a preview so that means we're saying god rested on the seventh day god rested for you know a thousand years <laughs> why would god need to rest a thousand years you know if we are being consistent that every day is like a thousand years or every day is like a million years then when it comes to day seven uh, god rested for you know seven million years or he didn't do anything for seven million years so he had everything and then if you also look at it a little closer he created adam on day six then he waited, you know, example, a thousand years or seven million years before he created Eve. So by the time Eve came along, Adam was seven million years old. You see? So, and, I, you know, we will go into all these details in the next question. So that day theory doesn't actually hold because you know, it, it makes everything very absurd. So, uh, uh, yeah, so we'll come into the details and we'll respond to that specific question uh, in the next part, okay? All right, but good, you brought it up and it's something we will address. So to begin with, we must understand the creative act of God, that in the creative act of God, what happened? Energy, matter, time, and space were brought into existence and they were compressed in an instant. So when you look at the Big Bang Theory, right, which we will talk about next week, basically through science, they agree that there was a beginning. So if you just look at the history of science about uh, uh, several, several hundred years ago, they believed that the universe, I mean, they couldn't explain it. So they just believed the universe was eternal. It always was there. Uh, it had, it just was, it was always there. But then, you know, uh, science began to understand that, hey, actually things had a beginning and, and the scientific reason for it. So science redefined things saying, no, we, things had to have a beginning. 
uh, uh, so Einstein himself played a major part in helping us understand that the universe had a beginning. So everything changed. Science said, okay, the universe had a beginning. But if the universe had a beginning, how did it start? So science says, there was nothing. In the beginning, there was nothing. And out of nothing came space, energy, matter, and time came into existence. So time started at that moment. So basically science, you know, in, in the Big Bang, we're saying out of nothing, there was nothing, but out of nothing came energy, matter, space, and time started. So that's a big step of faith to believe that. Or we say everything had a beginning. And as the Bible says, God created. So God always existed. And he created, he brought into existence these four important components of time, energy, matter, and space. He caused it to come into being. And in his creative act, what we consider as millions and billions of years, it all came together in a moment of time. And most importantly, like we pointed out in our class, class last week, the design for all of these things, the design for all of these things. So uh, science cannot explain to us where did all this, the design come from? For instance, science tells us there is gravity. And gravity is so much, you know, 9.8 meters per second squared. This is gravity. It exists here on Earth. And you go up, you know, science can give us all the details. It goes up here till this point, and then you're out of that um, uh, gravitational pull. So science can tell us all that, but doesn't tell us how did gravity come into existence in the first place. Science can tell us about, like this, many things, you know, the electromagnetic uh, pull is there, can measure it for us. So science only tells us what is there. It doesn't answer the question, how did it come into existence? Yeah. So that's the first thing as far as Genesis 1 is concerned. We believe in the creative act of God. And in God's creative act, all of these things were compressed into time. And that we believe. It's by faith. Because we believe God is powerful enough to do that. Okay. The second big question that Taisha pointed out is what we want to discuss, but again, based on Genesis 1, is, uh, you know, we read it, we read six days, you know, what happened in six days. So, science is telling us, no, 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 it's not six days. It's millions and billions of years. Like I mentioned, Earth is, you know, Earth is estimated to be 4 billion years old, the universe is 14 million years old, 14 billion years old. Uh, so these six days don't seem right. How would we respond to that? Now, what has happened in the Christian community? In the Christian community is that uh, over the years, you know, we. We, we respect science because it is a you know a, 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 a important field. It's a valid field. They are doing research, but in an effort to make Genesis and science to reconcile these six days in Genesis and uh, the information that science is giving us. In an effort to reconcile the two, Christians uh, have come put forward certain 
theories or ideas in trying to explain Genesis chapter 1. So there are three main theories. One is, you know, we uh, they've just given names to it. One is a gap theory, and I'll explain this. There's a day theory, and there's a theistic evolution or guided evolution. Now, again, these are theories. You cannot even prove it from scripture. Uh, but this is coming from the Christian community as a way to try and reconcile science to Genesis chapter 1. But I just want to point out the dangers in these theories. And if you ask me, uh, I do not subscribe to these th three theories and for the reasons I will share in the, uh, that I will mention now. Right? So the first theory, and I'll just go through this because you will read about it and, you know, uh, and so we'll come to a conclusion here, but let, let's just look at those. So the first theory is this, it's called the gap theory. The gap theory is that there's a time gap between Genesis chapter one, verse one and Genesis chapter one, verse two, because it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that means verse one, the heavens, space was brought into existence. Planetary bodies, planets, so that would include, you know, what we, uh, uh, other, uh, you know, say even asteroids, you know, whatever bodies that came in, that are, that the non-luminary bodies, the, the non-stars were brought into existence according to Genesis 1-1, including the Earth. And then there is verse 2, the Earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the waters. So the gap theory is that there was a big time difference between Genesis 1.1 and Genesis 1.2. Now, how big was it? It doesn't tell us. So people say, well, that could have been millions of years or billions of years. So therefore, when science says the earth is 4 billion years old, well, there's, you know, between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2, they say 4 billion years old. That's why the earth is so old. Or uh, maybe it was even more than that. That's why the, you know, the heavens are 14 billion years old. But then that has some problems, biblically speaking. First of all, we are reading into the white space between verse one and verse two, something that was is not explicitly stated for us in scripture. There is not, you know, there's nowhere to be find any inference or reference to that. Secondly, why would God, you know, uh, just leave things like that for billions of years? Why would he even do something like that, you know? Why would he leave something there? You know, verse 2 says the earth was without form and void. So, you know, if we are saying there was 4 billion years old, God created the earth and he left it for 4 billion years old, why would he leave it like that for 4 billion years old, you know, years? So in response to that, what some, and I'm not saying this is widely understood but what widely accepted but some christians have said there was a pre-adamic world between genesis 1 1 and genesis 1 2 uh, that there was life on earth on the planet and uh, things of that nature you know again there is not enough scripture uh, i think this will be one or one or two verses from jeremiah uh, isaiah and so on uh, it, but it doesn't back it up doesn't substantiate a pre-Adamic world, right? So my response, so personally, you know, I'm just saying personally, I, I'm, I'm making you aware of what's there in the Christian community. I'm not saying you should preach it or teach it. I don't, but I'm just making you aware because you might run into it. So personally, some people have tried to explain Genesis 1-1 like that. And uh, do I, so I, I don't do it, okay? This only in this class, 
in this place you would hear me talk about it i don't preach it from the pulpit or teach it no i'm just sharing it saying that look there are people who, who do this and but it is it is not you know it's not backed up by scripture another theory that that people have used to try to reconcile Genesis chapter one with science is what we call as a day theory, which is what uh, Teisha was mentioning. Where people say the day in Genesis one could have been many thousands of years, could have been. Now, here's the first thing. Uh, obviously the reference that, that uh, they would quote is what is stated in you know, in Second Peter three, where uh, Peter writes, you know, for with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Now, uh, very important, and this is Second Peter chapter three, and um, let's see, uh, uh, verse eight, Second Peter three eight, right? A day is like that. Now, just. Talking about 2 Peter 3 8, first of all, we must understand the context of what Peter is talking about is uh, uh, that he's talking about is, is getting believers ready for the coming of the Lord. Right? So, so he says, you know, don't be slack concerning the coming of the Lord. So he's, he's talking about the Lord's return. And in that context, he's saying, don't forget, you know, time is of no essence to God. The second thing that I want to point out about 2 Peter 3, 8 is he is using a comparison. That means that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. He didn't say one day is a thousand years, but he said, as a thousand years so we also so when we use that we are just using a comparison we are not stating a fact we are saying it is like this, something like this so it's not meant to be taken literally uh, it's meant to be taken as uh, you know a, a figure of speech as something representative you know so uh, you know, we even in our English language, we use it, you know, use a man, you know, uh, we use we, we use language like this, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, we, if we, for, for example, if you want to say something about a person, you would say, well, uh, you know, he is as like as somebody. It doesn't mean that he is that person, but he is like that. You know, whether you're talking about his mannerisms or character or so on, as it's used as a comparison. So that's something we need to keep in mind at Second Peter three eight. But more importantly, if you take the day theory of thousand years and you start applying it to everything here in Genesis one, because the day you know uh, is repeated often you'll find that it gets becomes very absurd. Right? So let's look at this day theory. Now, in the day theory, now in Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, it tells us very clearly the first day. What was it? It was the evening and the morning. So, it repeats that over and over again. Genesis verse 1, 5. <clears throat> again in verse 8, and I've given on the, the, the verses here, you've been, we know it. And verse 13, and verse 19, it says, the evening and the morning was the first day. So it's not leaving uh, anything ambiguous, evening and the morning was the first day. Right? Now, obviously, some will say, well, the sun wasn't there at that time. The sun was created on day four. There's no sun. So how could there be evening and morning? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. The earth was created, and the earth was already rotating on its axis. What defines an evening and a morning is 
of one full rotation of the earth right uh, uh, not a revolution but a rotation of the earth defines uh, a day so you don't need the sun to define the day uh, a 24 hour period a 24 hour period is is defined not not by the sun it's defined by one full rotation of the earth so it's fair fair to say that a single rotation of the earth which defines an evening and a morning was is it was a day and uh, it is still possible for a day to take place simply by the rotation of the earth in the absence of the sun doesn't matter so that's the first thing what is it throughout genesis it is explicitly stated evening and morning all right, it's already 9.50. Uh, all right. Um, okay. Uh, we will have to take a break here. Um, all right, so... Uh, all right, uh, is my voice clear? Others can hear it. I see. Uh, I clear. I see Sam's comment. So I'm sorry. I just saw it now. It's clear. Okay, fine. All right. Um, let's take a quick break, and I uh, will come back to this and let's see how far we can go. Uh, I'll try to go a little faster. And uh, okay, let's take a quick break, and we'll be back in uh, yeah ten minutes. Okay. Thank you. 